We last talked, uh, we were dealing with uh, German steps through the 1930s up until 1937. We finished with that Hulstbach Memorandum, which um, was in this meeting where Adolf Hitler is with his, some of his top military and, and uh, foreign policy advisors, and they're laying out um, desires to, to expand territory, acquire Lebensraum for their 85 million German-speaking people. What we're talking about today is the actual German expansion from 1938 um, into now World War uh, II uh, beginning. Uh, so now we're actually getting the ball rolling, the, the creation of that greater Germany, a uh, Germany for German-speaking people, and the acquisition of Lebensraum. We will start with um, Anschluss, the Anschluss with Austria. Uh, maybe this Christmas. Does anybody have a family tradition where you guys you guys get together and you watch uh, 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 The Sound of Music? You guys do that around Christmas time? Some people do that. Um, the Sound of Music, it's this musical from back in the day, and it takes place, the story takes place in Austria with this like rich family, and they've got a bunch of kids that sing. Um, and the backdrop of the story is the German Anschluss, the, the invasion of Austria by Nazi Germany. So next time you watch The Sound of Music, you'll be able to put it in some historical context. Um, let's give a little bit of a background to the actual uh, execution of this political union between Austria and Germany. We recall back in 1934, the Austrian Chancellor, a guy named Engelbert Dolfus, was assassinated by Austrian Nazis, right? And at that point, Italy, which, here's Germany, here's Austria, and Italy's down in the south. Benito Mussolini and Italy were quite concerned that Germany might be making a move on Austria, despite the fact that the Treaty of Versailles said no, Anschluss. So Italy mobilized 100,000 troops, sent them up to the northern border. And at that point, Hitler was weak, and there was no movement on Austria. But the next few years starts to change the, the balance of power between Italy and Germany. Germany is rebuilding their military in violation of the Treaty of Versailles, certainly, but no one's doing anything about it. So Germany is rebuilding their military. Uh, Italy gets involved in two very costly wars. First, where? Ethiopia or Abyssinia. The second, where? Spain, very good. And remember, Italy sends more uh, soldiers into the Spanish Civil War than any other foreign nation will send into the Spanish Civil War. Germany sends some help to the, uh, the fascists in Spain, um, but that's just in the form of the German Air Force, and it's going to largely come out of that conflict unscathed. So Italy fights a couple of very costly wars, while Germany is really just rebuilding their military. So by the time we get to 1938, the balance of power between Germany and Italy has, has shifted. For Austria's concern, in 1936, Germany and Austria sign what is called the Austro-German Agreement, where Germany will reaffirm Austrian independence. Hey, we're totally cool with you. Now, what do we call an agreement like this when it's between two nations? It's a bilateral agreement. We already talked about a, a, a German-Polish non-aggression pact. Uh, these bilateral agreements are easier to make, and they're easier to break, because we want to rhyme as much as we can in history, right? Neither nation would agree to not interfere into the other's affairs. And with this agreement, Austrian Nazis would be given a, a position, a prominent role within the Austrian government. So essentially, Austria, a little bit concerned about Germany to their north, Germany's rebuilding this military, the League of Nations has already proven itself to be weak, now with the Italian and Ethiopia example, and then before that with Manchuria. Austria's got to be a little nervous. We already saw that Germany... Oh, that chair there. We already saw that Germany and Poland signed a non-aggression pact because Poland can't trust the League of Nations anymore. And now Austria and Germany will sign their own agreement. So Germany stays out of Austria's affairs, but let some Nazis into your government. Yes? They, they're an independent government. Uh, they've got a chancellor uh, in 1936 and afterwards named Kurt von Schuschnigg. I'll write his name on the board in a second. By 1938, 
by 1938, political violence in Austria, and if you guys can remember, please don't forget that how did the fascists come to power in Italy? God, who was your teacher when you guys talked about this stuff? Yes, sir. Dissatisfied with their government and fascist black shirts started cracking people over the heads, right? There was political violence, which ultimately resulted in the fascists taking over in Italy. There was a, a march to Rome. And then the Nazis taking power in Germany. While they came to power through legitimate means, Hitler certainly consolidated his power. He grew stronger by having his... his uh, secret police and his SS and his SA, um, the, the brown shirts, his stormtroopers, certainly execute political violence in Germany. We start seeing some of the same happening in Austria in 1938, which leads that Austrian chancellor named Kurt von Schuschnigg, S-C-H-U-S, got to make sure, yes, C-H-N-I-G-G. -G. This, like, double G sound at the end of his name in German, according to Frau Zoller, uh, my teacher in high school, uh, has a sound, like, kind of like a H. So it's Schuschnig, Schuschnig, not Schuschnig, Schuschnig. Anyway, Kurt von Schuschnig is the, um, the chancellor of Austria in 1938. And there's political violence in Austria, a lot of it executed by these Austrian Nazis. So Schuschnigg, in hopes of getting out of this political violence situation, requests a meeting with Adolf Hitler. He requests a meeting with Adolf Hitler. He meets with Adolf Hitler in Germany. And hour after hour after hour, Adolf Hitler attacks and berates Kurt von Schuschnigg ultimately forcing him to give in to Adolf Hitler's demands. Like, he hopes that we're going to be able to meet and talk as two world leaders talk. And Hitler just, he says, does what's called dressing him down. He just tears into Kurt von Schuschnigg. To the point where von Schuschnigg is just going to give in to Adolf Hitler's demands. He went to Germany in hopes of getting Austrian Nazis to back down. In fact, it's going to get worse for Austria. He's forced to release pro-Nazi agitators from Austrian prisons, guys that had been arrested for political violence in Austria. They're now going to be released from prison. Austria will lift a ban on the Nazi party in, in Austria that had existed since this political violence had risen. Nazis will be appointed into the Austrian government. And the German and Austrian economies will be assimilated. They will be tied together. If, if Schuschnigg fails to meet these demands, Germany will invade. So we can say that this meeting went very poorly for Austria. In response, Schuschnigg goes back to Austria. Yes, ma'am. Oh, my bad. Um, that if, if you don't, uh, that the, the German and Austrian economies need to assimilate, need to become one. And if any of these demands aren't met, Germany will invade. Schuschnigg goes back to Austria, furious, obviously, with how this meeting went. And he calls for a plebiscite to be held. We've talked about this already. P-L-E-B-I-S-C-I-T-E. -E. A plebiscite is a vote of the people. Do the people of Austria want to maintain their independence? And if they did, if the public supported him, if the people said, yeah, we definitely don't want to be a part of Germany, we want to be independent, well then Schuschnigg might have justification to not go along with Hitler's demands, right? If the people are behind him, he could stand up to Adolf Hitler. Rather than letting a vote ever happen, though, rather than letting a vote ever happen, Adolf Hitler will mobilize his army. Adolf Hitler will mobilize his army and move in to Austria, executing the Anschluss. 
So German tanks and German soldiers will cross the border uh, into Austria. This happens on March 12th, 1938. Britain does nothing. France does nothing. Italy, who's now kind of an alliance with, with Germany, of course, they do nothing. The plebiscite that had originally been set up by Kurt von Schuschnigg to let Austrians decide, do you want to be a part of an independent Austria or not? Well, that vote will still be held. Now in April, this is a month after the Anschluss had been executed, and 99% of Austrians vote for Anschluss. Now, what, is it, what, do you, what happens inside your head and inside your stomach when you hear that 99% of people voted for something? That might be a little dubious, right? We might want to doubt the results of that election. Are people really feeling safe to vote their true conscience when the German military is at their front door? So, done. That's it. Austria is now a part of Germany. The political union has now taken place. And the rest of the world, the League of Nations, Britain and France, they do nothing. We'll talk more in a couple days about why they do nothing. But please keep in mind, especially Britain and France, those are democracies, right? If they went into Austria to drive the Germans out of Austria, that would be French sons and British sons dying to save the lives and the territory of Austrians. Are the Austrians even fighting here? Nope. The Austrians just let it happen. The Austrians did not fight for their own defense. And then in the next month, 99% of Austrians voted for Anschluss. So are you going to get your population to send its sons to, over to fight and die in a war to defend people who don't seem to want to even fight and die for themselves? Probably not. Probably not. So there's the Anschluss. Next, step two. The Sudetenland crisis. I'll write that on the board for you. Well, wow, there it is. I'll write it bigger. Sudetenland. The Sudetenland is, is Czechoslovakian land. Czech is the only hard part of that word. C-Z-E-C-H. Master that part of the word and you get the rest of it. Czech-O-Slovakia. The Sudetenland is the, the eastern border, or pardon me, western border of, of Czechoslovakia with, um, with Germany. It's a mountainous and resource-rich region of Czechoslovakia. And remember that Czechoslovakia didn't exist prior to World War I. So this was created, Czechoslovakia was created after World War I. This came out of the Treaty of Saint-Germain that broke up the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So there wasn't really any concern for the fact that there was German minorities in these Sudetenland regions of Czechoslovakia. After the Anschluss, Adolf Hitler focuses his attention on Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia has got a lot of things going against it when you're Adolf Hitler, considering Adolf Hitler's point of view. First, the people of Czechoslovakia, most of them, these are not German people anymore. Some are, but most of them are not. And if you were not German, in particular if you were one of these Slavic peoples in Eastern Europe, you were what Adolf Hitler considered an untermensch, or subhuman. You weren't as valuable in terms of your racial background. And what did Adolf Hitler's master plan call for? Racially pure, greater Germany with a racially pure Lebensraum. So you've got to drive these untermenschen out. Going back in history, and remember Adolf Hitler was from Austria? He lived in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Czech people, many people who were ethnically Czech, they kind of resented being ruled by Austrian governments, even back in the old empire. So Adolf Hitler's never really liked these folks. Czechoslovakia was a growing military power in Eastern Europe. 
Kind of seems weird. You would think it is a, a relatively poor and landlocked nation. But actually, as Czechoslovakia, is, as all of the, the Eastern European countries that are new after World War I is considered, Czechoslovakia is doing the best. They have the most functioning democracy in Eastern Europe. They have a very powerful and capable military. Much of that military has been funded by support from France. And we talked last week, France wanted to create what they call the Little Entente, countries in Eastern Europe that were friends with France, and France would support them. If, if Germany had gotten into a war with Czechoslovakia in 1936 or 1937, or even 1938, we're not sure who would have won that war. Czechoslovakia was formidable. But there are a lot of ethnic Germans in Czechoslovakia, especially in the Sudetenland regions. So these are that, that western portion of Czechoslovakia. So Adolf Hitler, hoping to create this greater Germany, a Germany for German-speaking people, is not fond of the fact that he has a powerful Czechoslovakia to his east that has millions, about three and a half million, ethnic Germans living within it. And those three and a half million ethnic Germans, they're minorities, they're ethnic minorities in Czechoslovakia. So many of them don't want to be a part of Czechoslovakia. Now, they don't want to move because their home is their home. And for many of them, it's been their home for, for generations. But they're ethnic minorities, and some of them feel mistreated by the majority Czech population. The Great Depression only exacerbates this problem. The German population in Czechoslovakia has a harder time with the Great Depression than does the, the Czech population. There's a man in Czechoslovakia. Oh, let me tell you about this really quick before, uh, before we move on. Uh, this fortification in Czechoslovakia is what um, was referred to as the Little Maginot Line. Now, we have not talked about the Maginot Line yet, have we? Does anybody know anything about the Maginot Line? No one's heard of it. Good. Um, we will. The Maginot Line is the line of fortifications, let's go back to this map here, is the line of fortifications that France will build along their German border. In the 1930s, the French were spending most of their military resources building the most awesome line of fortifications, defensive fortifications, that the world has ever seen. And they're called the Maginot, it's called the Maginot Line. Uh, we'll talk much more about this at a later date. Because France was supporting uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, Czechoslovakia is going to get its own version of the Maginot Line. In fact, sometimes referred to as the Little Maginot Line, along its border with Germany in, in the east there. And that picture that I showed you was just one part of these fortifications. And we can kind of see a lot going on here. You kind of, can you see how this is kind of on an elevated land? The territory of the Sudetenland is not only well fortified by this little national line, but it's also an elevated position. And going back 2,500 years ago to the writings of Sun Tzu, do you guys know who Sun Tzu is? He's this great Chinese thinker, military strategist, who wrote a book called The Art of War on how to, like, win war, win battles. And... Seems common sense, but holding on to the high ground is extremely important. It is far easier to defend a high ground and for your enemy to have to make it up those hills than it is to go the other way around. So the Maginot Line in the Sudetenland, these are highlands. These are, it's a mountainous region. And so the Germans would have a difficult time getting into it. In 1938... This man on the right here, his name is Conrad Heinlein. He is the leader of, he is the leader of the Sudeten German Party. It's, the, it's a political party of Germans in the Sudetenland. And in April of 1938, 
he will demand, so this is right on the heels of Anschluss, this is all happening very fast, he will demand political autonomy from Czechoslovakia. He wants to break free from Czechoslovakia. You guys hearing anything about this, like, Catalonian story in Spain, where, where Catalonia, this region of Spain, wants to become politically independent from, from the government of Spain? That's what he's looking for here for the Sudeten Germans. This will result in what is known as the May Crisis. The May Crisis is in May of 1938 where some German soldiers, German military, will mobilize along the border with Czechoslovakia, leading Czechoslovakia in turn to mobilize themselves. It's looking like a war might come between uh, Czechoslovakia and Germany. And please note that this happens after the Anschluss. So Germany has already proven itself willing and able to just send an army into a neighboring country. But Czechoslovakia is going to resist. Britain and France at this point step up and say, Whoa, ho, ho, Germany, stop. You don't push into Czechoslovakia. Well, the reality of this was the Germans were really never mobilizing. This was all unfounded rumors. And he had to let, Hitler had to let Britain and France know, we're not planning on doing anything of the like. Because they weren't ready. Germany wasn't ready to fight Czechoslovakia in 1938. Had Germany gotten into a war with Czechoslovakia in 1938, they might not have won. So they weren't going anywhere. And for Hitler, this was kind of an embarrassment. He had to admit, basically, that they're not ready for a bigger fight. But the Sudeten Germans are... Those Germans in the Sudetenland, they still want their independence. And their protests and escalating violence against the Czech government will ultimately lead to the British stepping in. And the British stepping in comes in the form, don't worry about the Munich Conference yet, I'll talk about that in a second, comes in the form of a British Prime Minister. And I wanted to show the picture so you guys can see him. British Prime Minister in 1938. He's a really important guy to know for our story. And he, there's probably, like, it's really easy to come up with the, the bad guys of 20th century history, like Adolf Hitler at the top of the mountain there. Um, Joseph Stalin joining him. There, there's a lot of bad guys of the 20th century. Neville Chamberlain hey, would probably go down, uh, would probably go down in history... as the guy that allowed it to all happen. Today, if there's, if there's ever um, an instance where a, a politician or a leader kind of gives in to a, an opponent, uh, Donald Trump right now uh, certainly calling out Barack Obama and this Iran treaty that, that was drafted in the past couple of years, right, to try to stop Iranian nuclear development. Donald Trump... And others might refer to Barack Obama as a Neville Chamberlain, someone that gives in to an enemy. Because Neville Chamberlain does this back in 1938. Now, Neville Chamberlain wants what most others in, Europeans, in Europe want at the time. They want to avoid a future war, right? They don't want another World War I. And what does Neville Chamberlain not know when, with every action he makes? What does he have no clue about? Yeah, he doesn't know everything that happens the moment after he makes any decision. We do. We have that unfair advantage over Neville, Neville Chamberlain. So we get to look back at Chamberlain, and people today will mock him, call him weak, and, and call him uh, you know, uh, complicit in Nazi crimes. Uh, he was just a British politician that was doing what the British people actually supported. He wants to avoid a war in Europe. Hoping to avoid a war... He organizes a series of meetings with Adolf Hitler to try to make a deal over this disputed Sudetenland region. In September of 1938, they meet for the first time. And it's, they, they meet in uh, like Adolf Hitler's 
wilderness, mountainous resort home uh, called Berktus Garden. You don't need to worry about that right now. And they meet, and they come up with an agreement that Germany will be able to absorb the German regions of the Sudetenland, the places of the Sudetenland that are majority German population. Those lands can be transferred to Germany. The French and the Czechoslovakians even agree to this. But here's the problem. If the French and the Czechoslovakians agree to give Hitler what he wants, what's that? Well, he, he might. We don't quite know this yet. But he's lost his reason for ever going to war. Right? Adolf Hitler wants a bigger war. He doesn't just want a couple crumbs from Czechoslovakia. He wants all of Czechoslovakia. So if Czechoslovakia actually, like, gives him what he wants, now he's got no reason to ever waltz in and take it all. He's got no justification for that. He needs Czechoslovakians being, like, abusive to Germans to give him a reason for going to war. So, despite having an agreement, Hitler backs out of it and makes even further demands. Now he wants all ethnic minorities in Czechoslovakia to gain their own independence, to have their own uh, rights asserted. Now, this sounds weird. Like, does Hitler sound like the champion of ethnic minorities? No. He doesn't want, he doesn't care about all these ethnic minorities in Czechoslovakia. He just doesn't want Czechoslovakia to be a strong and united country, right? Well, the Czechs, uh, oh, he also called for a military occupation of all of the Sudetenland. Now, why would that be dangerous for, for Czechoslovakia? Because that's where their defenses are. If Czechoslovakia were to give up all of the Sudetenland to Germany, now they're utterly defenseless against a German invasion. So that's going to be hard for Czechoslovakia to agree to. So with this, these second demands, France and Czechoslovakia will not go along with it. Which leads to a third meeting, just as it looks like war might be on the horizon. This one will be held in Munich. That's a city in southern Germany. And that's where that Beer Hall Putsch first was in Munich in late September of 1939. This meeting is organized by Benito Mussolini, who seems to be always pictured as if he knows something is going on right now. Like, not sure about the guy to his right. So in Munich, starting in late September of 1939, there will be a meeting. Germany is there, of course. Britain is there. Neville Chamberlain on the left. This is the uh, French foreign minister. His name is Edward de Ladier. You don't need to know his name. But he's there, or, or French president, I should say. And then we've got Italian, uh, Benito Mussolini. So France, Germany, Italy, Britain, all meeting in Munich to talk about Czechoslovakia. Two very important countries not at this meeting. Czechoslovakia, not invited to the meeting. You see how that could be problematic for some? And then the Soviet Union, they're left out as well. And they'll be a little bitter about this one too. Out of these meetings comes what's called the Munich Pact. According to the Munich Pact, or this Munich Agreement, Germany would be able to occupy the Sudetenland. Germany gets to take it all. This is in October of 1938. An international commission would be put together to decide future borders. Do you guys recall, quick time out, do you remember the Locarno conference we talked about already, about those, the peaceful internationalist 1920s? The Locarno conference solidified borders in Europe, the western borders. Eastern borders were left for future negotiations. Well, now we have future negotiations. Czechoslovakians would be able to leave the Sudetenland region and go into Czechoslovakia. While Germans living in Czechoslovakia would be able to enter freely into the Sudetenland region. Kind of doing a population exchange there. Out of these agreements in Munich as well, 
Poland would gain some territory where ethnic Poles living in Czechoslovakia would now get to go to Poland. Remember when Hitler was like, hey, there's other ethnic minorities that are being beaten up by Czechoslovakia too, like Poland. Let them go to Poland. He just, he doesn't care about them. He just wants Czechoslovakia to be weaker. Hungary would gain new territory from Czechoslovakia. So ethnic Hungarians could be going and being a part of, of Hungary. But then, most importantly, those four powers, Britain and France and Czechoslovakia, ah, Britain and France and Italy and Germany would all guarantee the independence and the sovereignty of the rest of Czechoslovakia. Okay? If Czechoslovakia, who wasn't even invited to this, if they tried to put up a fight, if they didn't support this Munich Pact, then Britain and France wouldn't defend them. Like, let's say Czechoslovakia was so angry with this agreement that they decided to resist Germany and not allow this Sudetenland region to be taken. Well, then Britain and France have essentially told Czechoslovakia, you're on your own. So you have to take this deal. You have to like it. And then we'll defend you going forward. If Hitler violates this agreement, we'll defend you. Czechoslovakia really had no choice. Neville Chamberlain will famously, or actually, let's put an I-N in front of that word, will infamously go back to England. And he steps off of his plane upon returning to the airport in London. And he tells a roaring crowd that has assembled to greet him that we will have peace in our time. That we've avoided war. And he holds up in his hand a piece of paper that is called the Anglo-German Declaration. That any international disputes between Britain and Germany would be solved through consultation. They would talk about it before going to war. Now, you're Hitler, you sign the Anglo-German Declaration, what kind of agreement is that? It's another one of these bilateral agreements. Chamberlain is thrilled. Chamberlain is thrilled. He says, we, have, we will have peace in our time, and today those are seen as some of the most embarrassing words spoken during the 20th century. He goes, because we know what's going to happen, right? There will be no peace. Adolf Hitler just gave, or pardon me, uh, Neville Chamberlain essentially gave away the Sudetenland region to Czechoslovakia, or of Czechoslovakia to Germany for free. And we know that war will just be a year around the corner. As early as October 21st, 1938, so this is just three weeks after the Sudetenland Agreement is, is signed, Adolf Hitler will call in Germany for the liquidation of the remainder of the Czechoslovakian state. So Hitler knew exactly what he was going to do when he signed on to this pact. He knew that this pact would not be, be supported, uh, or that, that Britain and France would not dare go to war over Czechoslovakia. He knew that if they, he could just take this inch today, he'd be able to take a mile tomorrow. That liquidation of Czechoslovakia will come in early 1939. In March of 1939... German troops will invade and occupy the remainder of Czechoslovakia. They had nothing to defend themselves with. They had already given away their defensive fortifications in the, in the, uh, the little uh, uh, Maginot line. There's no way the Czechoslovakians could stop the Germans from coming in. And Britain and France and Italy were all supposed to step up and stop that from happening. And they didn't. So what has now happened to the Munich Pact? It's torn up. It means nothing anymore. It means nothing. Britain, however, and Neville Chamberlain are furious about Adolf Hitler. Not furious enough to do anything about it. Not furious enough to do anything about it. But they're furious that Hitler would violate his word. That Hitler would violate that Munich Pact. And so going forward, there will be no more trust between 
Britain and Germany on any agreements that they would have. We'll pause there. We'll resume in a few